before we get into it, inshallah because there's different things i want to chop up with you first of all i want to know from you how what's your take on our brother andrew tate now brother andrew becoming a muslim mashallah alhamdulillah bro it's good it's good alhamdulillah very happy it's a w for islam and w for the ummah 100 100 percent. i saw a lot of uh, kopi type comments who cares so what's the big deal and like you it's guys don't understand like allah it's uses high. allah uses his slaves he uses his slaves sometimes influential individuals from amongst his slaves to help bolster and strengthen the religion Tay yeah. is a man who has a lot of influence never mind his money that could benefit the dawah but he's a man of influence and already i've seen in the comments of my videos of Pikachu's videos, of Hijab's videos, different individuals, Christians, atheists, etc., either saying they have converted or they're seriously considering coming to the religion just off the back of his conversion alone. Yeah, man, 100%. In fact, I wrote an article about this yesterday. I published it yesterday. I posted mm. it in the NSM group. I posted part of it and a link to the article. Basically, it's about this. And the cope, the majority of the cope is hasad. It's, like, it's envy. Oh, They're like, people are jealous. <clears throat> And before, when he was a kafir, like they had a trump card. Yeah, okay, he's rich, he's got women, he's got cars, but he's a kafir, he's going to hell, no problem. Sahih. I got to, you know, straight to yep. the hardest part of the hellfire. But then he became Muslim. Mm. Khalas, no, now, you... What can you say now? And so now it's cognitive dissonance. So okay. it's like there's a, like Andrew says, there's a glitch in the matrix. And so either you, you reconcile the new reality or you're going to feel this cognitive dissonance. No, you hit the and, nail on the head there, Akhi, when you said it's hasad. It stems from hasad. You're right. Because nobody, and I've said this in one of my videos, like Andrew's made, he's made no bones about his accomplishments as a man, right? So he's made no bones about it. He's, he's rubbed it in everyone's faces. So we're all quite well aware of what he's achieved. And it's legitimate. He's not just yeah. chatting rubbish. It's actually the truth, yeah. right? But that obviously stirs the insecurities of a lot of individuals who are insecure or who haven't achieved much themselves. But you're right. They had that one trump card. All right, so what if he's got the dunya? He's going to the hellfire if he does like this. Now he's Muslim as well. Yeah, and there's too many blessings. What's going on? <laughs> and the funny thing is, the funny thing is, Andrew, on many occasions, he said, um, and I'm paraphrasing here, he said, I truly believe that God has favorites and I'm one of his favorites. Yeah. If you think about it now, it's, it's like a dua. It's, and there's a hadith about it. It's like what you, and I wish I could, I know the exact hadith, but it's like what you intend, you get. Is why there's a I get annoyed with all these people who like this dua to talk about and just be content with what you have and all these things. But because like you don't know your qadr, right? Your qadr could be that you're a trillionaire. Your qadr, qadr could be that you're Elon Musk, and you won't know until you try to get it. Yeah, you don't you know, know if I'm, you're a millionaire or a billionaire. That kind of. Thing. I'm so glad you brought that up, Akhi. I want to touch on that for a second because we do have, and, and it is a cope. There is it's tr there is truth in it, but the way that it is interpreted by the Muslims, they turn it into a cope. So the truth of the matter is your risk. What's written for you is written for you. However, what I have found in the Muslim community is the way we have digested and internalized this is, I shouldn't try. I should just do the bare minimum and just get by because ultimately, whether I try or don't try, I'm only going to get what was written for me. So I might as well not try very hard. You see what I'm saying, Akh? So I, how would you balance that? The sort of, okay, your risk is your risk. But see, I need try. How would you balance that yourself? In my case, I had to change change my mindset around things like ambition. It, it just generally happens when you go, when you start down the path of entrepreneurship. Asim Talib has this saying, the two, the two most addictive drugs are heroin and a monthly salary, right? So when you're in that salary mode where you're not, you're not a hunter, you're just is like... Is he the a, author of The Black Swan, Asim Talib? Yeah, he, he, yeah, he's the one who wrote The Black Swan. He uh, hates Islam, that guy. You know? He hates yeah. Islam, <laughs> But he's got, he's got good yeah. books. He's got good books. But he, he also, he lost a bit of influence over the past two years because he cucked over the lockdowns and the uh -huh. cough and things like that. The coof, <laughs> they call it. The coof. The coof. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And so you just have to change, you have to change your mindset around, around things like a lot, things like wealth and things like that. And then whatever you want to get, actually, if you work hard enough for it, you're going to get it really, honestly. So it's not about whether it's in your qadr. The thing is, you cannot see your qadr. It's, and this is like a poker reference, but... Like when you play poker, there's the hands that are about to get dealt and the hand that you have. If you knew exactly what cards are going to get dealt, like you would be able to play the hand perfect. But you don't know what cards are going to get dealt. So you can only play the hand that you're dealt. And so because you cannot see the qadr, it really doesn't matter what your qadr is. Whatever you want, just go for it. Whatever you want, try to get it. And you know, whether I it think... comes to you is, yeah, 
Go ahead. I think there's an element of it's a protective mechanism in that if I don't try or if I don't try hard, I don't have to face up to the disappointment of failing. If I just do the bare minimum, I can get by with my cope and simply tell myself this was what was written for me. Whereas when you try hard at something and you actually invest time, energy, money, emotional investment, time investment, financial investment, and then it still fails, that hurts a lot more than if you had simply just sat back and said, I'm going to do the bare minimum. And what do you think about this? You can choose your pain, right? The thing about taking risks is there's risks that are going to come, like no matter whether you like it or not, you have no idea. There's a lot of people who were very comfortable and safe on their salaries two years ago. And in over, like in just a few weeks, they lost their job. There was like 60 million people out of work just in the US alone, right? Or oh, in two years ago. Mm. And so there's risk, no, no matter how we, which way you play it, there's going to be risk. And the difference is I, you can have a risk that you choose, okay, that you have a little, at least a little bit of control over. Or you can have the risk that you have absolutely no control over. Mm. And for me, when the as my as a personal example, when the lockdowns happened, I was not affected at all. I worked from home. My business actually grew that year, and so all because I took this risk of deciding, no, let I'm going to work for myself. I'm going to start my own business, and whatever comes and whatever doesn't come, and that's okay by me. That makes for a good segue then into who you are. Tell us about you, because I know you've been in this space a lot longer than I have, for that matter. And you've got an article that is still, mashallah, I just read it and I didn't even know you last month. Hilarious article. Absolutely brilliant. I genuinely benefited from a, from an ilm perspective as well, with regards to the do's and don'ts of intercourse from an Islamic perspective. Tell the people what's your background, what you do and so on. Tell them. All right. I'm Nabil Aziz. I'm, I guess you could say an entrepreneur, although I'm more like a marketer, I guess, not specifically an entrepreneur. I'm based out of Dubai. I've been here since 2006, started a family here, all that. And uh, around 2000, I can't remember if it was 2013 or 2015, I started this blog called Becoming the Alpha Muslim. And I, it's either the second or third article that I wrote was this article that you mentioned is called the definitive guide to halal and haram sex acts and so that article was written probably in 2015 but to this day it gets 5,000 to 8,000 impressions just amazing uh, oh, organically but if you look if you go inside google search console it tells you what people are searching for that that make that drive them to this article and it's all it's filth <laughs> <laughs> So you want to know, can, you, like, can you put the link in the chat real quick? I want to pull this article up on the screen just for the brothers. Yeah, we can do that. One second. Yeah. So this article is, it gets a lot of traffic. I don't know if it's high quality traffic or not, because it doesn't seem to drive a lot of conversions, whatever I put on the page. So like, maybe I should try to just go for email signups that might. This is it, bro. I'm telling you, yeah, you've got a way of capturing attention, flipping out. <laughs> as soon as I got to here, yeah. I was like, Muslims like to F2. I was like, I need to carry on reading. What is this about? And then you just go straight in. Like, I'm feeling a bit like, I'm feeling a bit shy to say these words right now. But look, I'm going to highlight them right here. Look at this. And then you back it as well, mashallah, with evidence from Quran and Sunnah. And it's all legit. It's all. And you know what? I'm actually going to put the, le the link in the, in the description, inshallah. So if you guys want to read this. No, you must read this. Not if you want to. You need to read this. Then read it, inshallah. Ta what was the inspiration behind this, Akhi? Please tell me. It's actually it's there on the website. The problem with some of these links, they're, they link to Fatawa. Yeah. And some of the pages are broken. But if you scroll up, you'll see some screenshots of Reddit posts. So I got a lot of I got a lot of shit for this article when it came out. It was right. like all the it was very it became it was an issue. So I used to be very active on Reddit and these questions came up a lot. Uh, mm. questions about couples that were just about to get married or the people they've already been married and they had questions. And so I remember taking screenshots of those screenshots on this page. And so I decided, okay, let me and this article started off as a Reddit post where I where I wrote like a summary of the ruling on oral sex. And so I remember the title of the Reddit post was like spit or swallow. That is so this I think this this post actually dominates all of the search results related queries related to sex by Muslims. Because you can see even I included screenshots up at the top where like 
the, the type of queries that people, Muslims are Googling when they ah. come. So you see, so this is what people want to know about. And so I guess I was right in writing this article. Yeah, you definitely touched on something. And this was what, seven years ago? Yeah, it was around 2015 when I published this article. Well, I guess it's timeless. It's actually sex, regardless of how, <laughs> what, what day it is. Okay, mashallah. So then c continue us through your journey then. So this article, you published it in 2015 or 2016. Yeah. And then uh, walk us through your journey from there. And in fact, before that, you must have already had a background in this arena, in this area, long before you decided to start creating your own type of content. So walk me through that. I wouldn't say that. I wouldn't say necessarily that I had any kind of inclinations as to these things. I used to, I, I grew up not really practicing, but I would say after 2006, I believe it was around 2008 where I got religion. And then I was more into like the Dawa kind of thing, seeking knowledge, going to Halakat and all these, all these things. I used to volunteer at one of the Islamic centers that were, that, that were, that was here locally. So I was heavy into that. And then after I got done with that, eventually I had this, always had this idea. At some point I started reading about like the, I stumbled on the red pill stuff. Okay, at some point, I can't remember what, what, what it year was. exactly, right, what year? It might've been around 2013. Oof, um, that's early okay that's yeah, early, early around 2013 because that's about how old becoming the alpha muslim is i saw i saw i started reading all this stuff and like consuming a lot of the material you no know, rouge roisey rollo tomasi the red pill subreddit married red pill the married red pill subreddit and just i just went down the rabbit hole and i always had this problem with muslim feminists and the way I saw the preachers and the imams and the khatibs, basically they were like just dressing down the men at every, every possible opportunity for not fulfilling the women's rights and all this stuff. And there's, a, there's I guess there's an occasion where that's relevant. And, but when it becomes like 99% of the discourse and the rights of the men over the women are, are not mentioned at all, then it becomes a problem. And so I had this idea in my head for starting this blog and eventually I launched it and it was the, the angle was to be like self-improvement, like practical stuff, right? For Muslim men who are trying to practice their religion and trying to go through life and live life to the best of their ability. There's a lot of Islamic advice out there, but there was no self-improvement advice. And so that was the angle behind the blog. And so I started writing articles. I started a podcast. There's a bunch of episodes I've made them private now. There was a lot of stuff that we did that I did for the blog. Problem was I wasn't able to visit too fast. So I was spending a lot of time doing a lot of work, but it wasn't actually getting any benefit. And the blog was growing quite slowly. And I had this, I had my business on the side. I'm a marketer and I run a marketing agency. And so I decided to focus more on that and pause that. And then. So I pretty much neglected that becoming the alpha Muslim blog for a while, for several years. Although I, I still went, I would still go in and up, update the, some of the articles because when you update the articles on your blog, and this is like an SEO tip, you have a website, you update the articles, the pages on your website, and you change the date to the most recent date, the date mm -hmm. of publishing. Google thinks this brand is new content and, and it will give you a boost in the rankings for that content. Uh... Um, uh, interesting. And so I very recently, I think two months ago or a month ago, I went into becoming the alpha Muslim and I updated a lot of pages. And within about two to two weeks to 30 days, I jumped up from about 5,000 visits a month to 8,000 visits a month. Just like that. Just and by this is just my content. little, that little SEO tweak. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. It's good to know. So you update the content and then you change the publishing date to very recent. How much yeah. updating are we talking about? Like few, wholesale changes lines. or just small tweaks? No, no, just a few lines. Maybe add a new image or two, clean up the, re-edit the articles, that kind of thing. Move some stuff around. So it looks like it's been edited and then you republish it with a new, with a new publishing date and Google thinks it's a new article. So that's a marketing tip for you guys. Smart, smart. But then while i was trying to run this website i came across this domain i do you know abu productive from productive muslim no okay he's like the original self-improvement guy in the muslim space old school the fact that you don't know him means he's like mm. the oldest of the old school like he's the original right. 
So he's, he's a productivity guy, not self-improvement. So he was like, how do Muslims become more productive using lessons from the Quran and Sunnah and things like that? So he owned this domain, muslimman.com. He said, hey man, I'll give, it, I'll give, this, give you this domain. I'm not u- using it right now. But he let the domain expire. And so uh-huh. I had to actually buy the domain and I ended up paying, I think I ended up paying $4,000 or $5,000 for this domain. Oof. And I bought this years ago, years ago. So it's been with me ever since. That, I, how much I, I must it be worth now? How much is it worth now, that domain? It must be it's worth not, a lot. It's not worth, I, I wouldn't say it's worth much. It's there for, it's like I could probably sell it for about five or $6,000 because it's a brand, brandable domain. But I'm not going to sell it because I, I have plans for it. And I always wanted to, you do something with this domain. I had an idea of maybe making Muslimman.com the shop and keeping becoming the alpha Muslim, the blog. But I decided to start a brand new thing with this. And the problem with becoming the alpha Muslim is it's a little bit too narrow. And it's, it really, it's uh, preaching to the choir. And so having something a little bit more general and I positioned it as a lifestyle brand so I can pretty much talk about whatever I want as opposed to just red pill stuff. So I launched this website or this lifestyle brand called muslimman.com. And it's a particular, I, I saw a gap in the online Muslim masculinity kind of space. So a gap almost in the market, man. Of, yeah. Almost all of the content is on YouTube right now. There's very little written material other than maybe Daniel Hakikachu, but Daniel Hakikachu is polemics and mm. apolog- apologia. And so, and so his articles and things like that are for, of, in that nature from a masculinity kind of Muslim self-improvement thing. There is, there's really nothing in, in terms of written material. And well, so, let me ask you about that then, because I took Gary V's advice a couple of years ago, and he mentioned some stat that by 2022, I think it was 85% of all content online will be consumed through videos. So basically, everyone needs to start making that transition. So there's two ways to view this. Number one, everyone needs to start creating videos. Or number two, everyone's going to be creating videos. Therefore, I should continue writing because that will be a smaller and smaller niche. How do, how, did you, how do you interpret this? Because me, myself, I don't read much. I, I generally watch, but that might be something to do with my age. You're, you're absolutely right. And I have plans to do video as well because I have a YouTube channel with this brand. But my strength is in writing. Even though I could make a lot of videos because I have made a lot of videos for becomingthealphamuslim.com, mostly like podcast interviews and things like that. But I've made the, all of those private now. But... The idea was to start with something that I know my area of expertise, which is like writing and sending emails and things like that. Email marketing is what I do with most of my clients. And then eventually branch out into other forms of content. My idea was for not for me to be the actual face of this website, muslimman.com. I want to actually have writers doing the writing. And in fact, I've commissioned two pieces from two different writers. Hopefully they'll be published one in December, at least in December, and the other one probably in January. And then I had the idea to monetize it from the beginning. So I commissioned, I didn't try to create a product myself. I commissioned somebody to do it, which is the guys at Wordsmiths. They're a, a translation and editing company. And so they're working on that. That's So that book is coming out in January. So the idea is not for me to do all the work. It's for me to be like the CEO and get other creators to produce the content for this website and so even if we do start on youtube it's i don't want to be on youtube for this brand i want it to be like other hosts and things like that interesting that makes it from a perspective of ownership because as a youtuber all right it might be your own channel and you might be able to make videos when you whenever you want but the truth is you're an employee yeah your boss is youtube and if they don't like you they'll sack you that really is the bottom line. So when you own your own domain and you're creating your own content on there, I don't know, can the internet kick you off? Is there a way of getting kicked off? You can get there kicked is. off. You can get kicked off. You, your domain can be shut down. The uh, uh, host, web host can refuse to host you. And so what I recommend for every online creator, online brand, personal brand, whatever you are, is start creating an email list. And even email service providers can refuse to work with you, but you have the emails. So you can keep, you can go to any email service provider who will allow you to send emails. So number one is start growing an email list. And of late, like you, you should start growing SMS lists as well. That's important. There's two like pillars of building an online brand. Number one is own your platform. Okay. And number two is never let anybody get between you and your. And so that's why a lot of these YouTube creators, they get, they're getting big or they're, they might be getting big on TikTok, like Pearl, Pearl, right? You've been on Pearl. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
So her TikTok got banned, right? Yeah. And she was up to, I don't know, almost a million, million yeah, followers. Yeah, million. Yeah. Yeah, she should have been, she should have been growing her email list. Andrew yeah. Tate. Andrew Tate never used to push his email list a lot, a lot. As soon as he got deplatformed, the email list was getting pushed and pushed. All right. Mm. So that's the number one thing that he promotes right now is go, is signing up to the email list because he knows now, okay, if I get deplatformed, I need to have, I need to capture the audience that's on these platforms. And so if you're on YouTube, if Abu American, Mahdi, Three Muslims, Jibril, Coach Kareem, all of these guys, they need to be growing email lists. And so that's probably your number one thing before you even actually sell products. Because if you have the email list and you can e email them anytime, you can sell them whatever you want. You've so, got, to, yeah, because the truth is when someone signs up to YouTube, YouTube has their email. So they own the email list and they know all the emails to your subscribers, but you don't get that privilege. Exactly, exactly. So you are actually, you're actually growing their business. It's like the Amazon model as well. Amazon knows who's buying your product, but as a merchant on Amazon, you don't know who's buying your product. You will see the name and everything, but you, there's no way for you to be able to contact them yourself through an email. So that's a valid point. And to those of you who are considering starting your own online brands or businesses or services or whatever the case may be, brother, the bill is absolutely right. I can't emphasize that enough email and sms i found sms in my experience to be more open rates are way higher way higher like 95 percent. who doesn't open a text message but it's just a lot more expensive especially if you've got a big list of mobile numbers it can get really costly it's good the fact that you created no strings nikah is is probably the was probably the best move that you could have done because to, to sign up they got to put their email address in so you're collecting email addresses how many people in there now thousand more like two thousand yeah, nearly two thousand yeah nearly two thousand exactly so out of your youtube following you managed to turn get two thousand of the right kind of people because if they're signing up for no strings nikai like they're down with you like they've bought into your message they've bought into your ideas and they might be looking for the kinds of products and things that, that you're selling so these are high quality contacts that you're getting into this thing Mm. And so, and then I, some of them are got their phone numbers in there. So you could probably build your SMS list off of that. Probably yeah. the best thing that you could have done is, is this app. Alhamdulillah. SubhanAllah. It's funny that you say that because I never built the app with the mind or the view that I need to have my, uh, another platform away from YouTube, just in case YouTube shut me, down, shut me down. That was never the intention. The intention was really like, there's a problem. Let's have a, let's find a solution for it. But you're absolutely right. Because this whole community thing, the groups, that has all spawned out of the natural evolution of the app. I didn't know it would go this way. And every day, because it's interesting, because I touch base with my app developer almost every day. And it's interesting to see how the app evolves and the different twists and turns it takes based upon the member interaction, member feedback, and just getting a feel for where, because the truth is, honestly, like Gary Vee said it once as well, he was like, let me just tell you something, yeah? I'm a multimillionaire. Nobody knows what the F they're doing. I don't know what I'm doing. Yeah, as an entrepreneur, it's like, you can make an educated guess. You can speak to intelligent people and get their advice. But the truth is, there is no blueprint and nobody knows what they're doing. So, so you just do your best anyway. I'm sure absolutely. you can relate to this as an entrepreneur yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Like, really, you got to just do, get the reps in is how you get the experience. And you can't really get the reps until you actually go out into the market and do it for real. Yeah. So yeah. even, so me, I'm a copywriter, right? And there's all these courses around copywriting, any skill that you want to learn, right? There's all these courses around these skills that you can learn. You'll never learn as much as when you actually try to do it for real. And so the you, the, you get good fastest, let's say as a copywriter, when you're actually writing for clients. And the more reps you could get in, the more feedback you can get. And the more you know, in the case of copywriting, whether your copy is actually selling the product, then okay am i getting good or is this not right for me because the courses will only teach you it only teaches you theory the applicant is the proof is in the application 100 percent. i use this example a lot online which is you'll never learn how to swim through reading a book you actually have to get in the water actually on the contrary you could learn how to swim just by getting in the water and never reading a book you'll swing but swim best by getting in the water and reading a book on how to perfect your mechanics but simply reading the book you'll never know how to swim you've got to get in the water and feel the water how it moves against you if you're in open water how does the current move against you how do you adjust your body you can't simulate that in in a theorized environment when i was again when i was touching base on my app developer when we were talking we were very much on the same mindset and i said to him look i've done i've opened up a number of businesses now the vast majority of them failed 
obviously it's part, it's part of the course and one thing i found is you can't theorize your way to a perfect product actually that it borders on arrogance thinking that you know what the market wants that you know what the customer wants it borders on arrogance you have to and iterate and that means you have to put a bad product out and i remember hearing another uh, businessman talk about with uh, it was physical products he said if you're not embarrassed by your first but the first version of your product you're not moving fast enough and this is hard this is a hard pill to swallow and accept that i have to put a mediocre product out first before I can make it better. It's hard because you want it to be really good. But the truth is you don't know what really good looks like in the first place. How do you know until you put it into the market, get feedback, iterate, put it back out, get feedback from the market, iterate, put it back out on and on until you eventually stumble in the dark to somewhere that looks like the right place to, to go, if that makes sense. Yeah, and then there's this saying that gets passed around a lot on Twitter. It's first time entrepreneurs build a product first, second time entrepreneurs build a landing page first, and third time entrepreneurs build an audience first. Mm. And so they realize that the number one thing that you're going after is one, you need distribution, okay? And two, you need people to get the feedback from. Mm. That's why the audience is the most important thing. And if you start off with an audience, everything else becomes easier. So if you take a look at people like, like the, like big name YouTubers, like PewDiePie or Mr. Beast, like they launch a product, it's like an instant win because they have this captive audience mm. that they've built a relationship for a very long time. And so if you're interested in creating your own products, it's very important to also do a lot of audience building rather than just trying to put the product out and see if you can find sellers for it. And that's the hard thing to do because the truth is building an audience, it's the most fruitful in the long term, but it's the hardest to do because it takes a long time. You have to build trust with your audience and over a period of years, we look at the likes of Mr. Beast and PewDiePie. PewDiePie is my age. Mr. Beast is like 22, 23, but they've been doing it for 10 years since they were kids. PewDiePie, since, oh, sorry, Mr. Beast since he was like 11 years old. So they are very advanced in their journey, despite their relatively young age. They still started off with zero subscribers like everyone else. And you're absolutely right. Like it takes time. It does take time. And I think that's the hardest part to accept in a, the microwave society that we live in, which is I want it quick. I want it now. And if I can't get it now, then I don't want it at all. And in fact, that makes for a brilliant segue, Nabil, onto the experience I've had with dealing with brothers with regards to marriage on no strings the care and otherwise in that so many men in the age bracket of late teens to mid to late thirties, which is the majority demographic I deal with have such little fortitude with regards to just like doing the work. It sounds so cliche and boring, but flipping just doing the work, like improving different elements of your, whether it's your character or your Dean or your physique or your, finances or whatever they have such a low tolerance and drive for that why is that in your view what i think is because of the birth control in the water and really water. you think that yeah <laughs> so if you look at the studies no i'm well aware of it i've the, read the book estro generation i'm well aware yeah, of it exactly yeah. so what do you call it the testosterone levels have dropped yep. sperm 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 counts have dropped all that stuff over like 50 years or something. They did this study and I think they did this study in Israel or something, but they found out that basically today's men are not as manly as the men of 50, 50 years ago. So that's mm. one thing. You hear it, like you hear it in their voices. They have, they have what they call them in, it call it in America muffin tops. So like they have a lot of, they're basically soft. They have a lot of belly fat, even though they're young and in the prime of their lives. They have very uh, womanly voices. So like estrogenized voices, they have receding, receding jaws because like their jaws haven't developed properly because of this. And so that's one aspect of it. All right. And then the other aspect is obviously, I don't know. I don't know how, did you, did you grow up with internet or, or no? I, let me see now. I was born in 89. We, ha, I, we I believe we had the internet connection by late nineties, but it was dial up and my dad had a password on it. So first yeah. of all, I'd have to take out the phone wire to put the internet wire in. Yeah. Then it would Same take thing. 10 years to load up. So it just wasn't worth the bother in the first place. And the internet wasn't that advanced. So there wasn't that much to do anyway. And my dad was so strict. He's, You're going on the internet. No internet, it's 50p, 50p an hour, you cannot go. 
<laughs> so even like, if so I you had... to go, it was like for two minutes at a time, and then there's nothing to do. So it wasn't really a thing, to be honest with you. Yeah. So you and me, like we we are the gen- we the generation that is like uh, bridging the gap between the non-internet world and the internet world. Mm-hmm. So we know what it's like to grow up without the internet. But these young these kids, they've grown up with smartphones in their hands. Right. And like anything they need is like instant access. And so basically they're, they, it's rewired their brain, I would say. And so they don't know what it's like to actually have to take time to achieve, achieve an outcome because they're able to get outcomes that they need in, in like seconds, maybe like less yeah. than 10 seconds. So that's, a, that's probably the other. I think that's an excellent point. You're absolutely right. The microwave mentality, I can get everything now straight away. Even that simple thing that I mentioned to you just now, the dial-up broadband, it wasn't broadband, it was dial-up, the dial-up yeah. internet. Just that time waiting for it, that excruciatingly long amount of time. It didn't really yeah. feel excruciating because that, that was the process. But you're right. Everything comes so quickly and so easily now. And actually, even if you look at, for example, the only way to get more views on your videos is to feed into that mindset. How to get abs in six minutes. Bruv, you ain't getting abs in six minutes. I'm just telling you it's not going to happen. Okay. But that's what the people want. And then you're torn between, okay, this is what the people want and this is what they'll click on. But if they, I'm going to be misleading them. But then on the other hand, let's say you're a fitness YouTuber. If I tell them the truth, actually it's hard and it takes long and you need to be dedicated to over a long period of time. Nobody's going to click on that. Nobody's going to. Do you see the problem? So then we feed into this thing. And I've had, I'm, I have mixed feelings with regards to the youngsters that I deal with. Because on the one hand, I am empathetic towards their plight. Because now you have the other side of the equation, which is, so first of all, we have the estrogen thing. Then we have the microwave mentality. And then we have sisters or women in general who can afford to be more fussy now because of the type of the the comfortable world that we live in, at least in the West. And then coupled with what they see on Instagram, their expectations are inflated and elevated. So it's like this trifecta of problems, the estrogen thing, the microwave mentality, and then the sisters with their inflated expectations. And this is why we find ourselves in this cliche marriage crisis, which we have on our hands. Do you have children, Akhi Nabil? Yeah, I've got four. MashaAllah. How old is your oldest? She is... Actually, I don't know their, <laughs> I don't know their ages. <laughs> well, do you have a son? She's around, she's around 11. She's around 11. The son oh, okay, is... Okay. The, my son is the youngest. Um, okay. So they're young. They're very young, MashaAllah. Okay. Yeah. So uh, what are you doing or what advice would you give to other parents who are raising young children, including myself in this environment to give them an edge? Because I believe that it doesn't take much to give them an edge because the, the standard is so low. Bess, yeah, and it's still, what advice would you give? What are you doing for your kids? In my case or in our case, the girls are in jujitsu. So they're learning martial arts like from a young age. So that's going to give them a discipline because they they have to work hard. They're like they win sometimes. They lose sometimes. Okay, that's important. They know they need to know what it feels like to lose, and they need to know how to. Okay, when they lose, what can they learn from it? Come go back, fix the mistakes, come back and see if they win again. That kind of thing. So that's one aspect. The other aspect, like if we're talking about the marriage situation, I would be trying to get them married off as as soon as possible. I know your dad helped you out when you were young to help you get married. That's been my view since back in the day. When it's time for the kids to get married, what am I going to do? Am I going to send them off to university until they're like 22, 23, 24, and then they're going to have a hard time? Or am I going to make it easy for them? I would say that's one of the biggest problems is the issue of the young people not being able to fulfill their sexual desires in a halal way. And I remember what it was like to be a teenager. You're all piss and vinegar. And my parents didn't do nothing about it. It wasn't even a thing. Go to university, get a degree, and then inshallah, one day we'll find you a wife. Mm. Between the time I hit puberty and the time I get married, that's 15 years, bro. What's going to happen? 100 percent there's without a doubt there's going to be some haram that's going to happen so what's the point what are we trying to do here are we trying to actually raise our kids in an islamic way or are we just trying to do things that don't work anymore so that's my view i'm just going to try to get them married as early as possible Mm. obviously it's going to be up to them i'm not going to force them to get married or anything like that but 
I'm going to plant the seeds, ask them, do you want to get married and help them find an appropriate husband or wife? And then whatever I can do to support them, I'll do it. I know this one family in Dubai, the kid grew up around the Islamic center. And when it was time for him to go to university, the parents got him married and they both, the two kids got married, husband and wife went off to university together. Now imagine how easy that kid's life was. He's a Muslim kid. He's married. Now he's in university. How much easier that is. As I mean, opposed to you going to university, single kid, freedom for the first time, there's pum pum everywhere. Even if you're a proper namazi, wearing the tobe, short tobe with the beard and the hat and all that stuff, something's going to happen, bro. Something's going to happen. I can relate to this experience because as you guys know, I got married when I was 16. The night before I got married, I was not practicing. By practicing, I mean I wasn't praying. I was just your regular 16-year-old kid. Immediately after my nikah, it's like Allah just flipped my heart. And then I never missed a salah in my life ever again. I dropped all of the haram, like music, girls, female friends, everything just all dropped in a single night. And that's all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I remember the next day after I got married, I had to go on a school trip. <laughs> there was no honeymoon. I had school the next day. I went on this psychology trip with the, school, with the college. And the dhuhr came in. And I remember exiting the amphitheater. And finding somewhere random to pray dhuhr. It was like something else was in control of my body. And I was like, wow, this is weird. I'm actually going out of my way to pray on time as well. Like, that's a bit of a surreal experience. But then I finished college and I went to university. And you're absolutely right, Akhi. There was absolutely zero fitna for me, alhamdulillah. I was married. And because I was new to practicing the deen, when you're new, you're fired up. I was wearing thobe every day. I had my little topi as well. No girls were going to come to me because I was just like, just stay away. I was involved with the Islamic society. And it was not a problem at all. Girls were never a problem for me post getting married because I had my outlet. I had my wife and I had my outlet. And it's night and day difference. It's night and day difference. Yeah. I can relate to this viscerally because I went through that. That was me. I was that guy. I got married young and I went to college and I went to uni and there was no problems. I had no problems with girls, alhamdulillah, because of that. I don't know what's wrong with the parents, just Muslims in general. Do they even remember being uh, no, I don't like think pubescent, do. pubescent boys? Um, mm. When you're horny, you cannot think straight. You're almost insane. You're like a heat-seeking missile. There's only one thing that you're going after. It's very, like, they don't realize. I, I don't know what's going <laughs> I don't know, man. Maybe I'm just more in tune with this, but it makes no sense to me the way that we behave as a community, knowing that the only way that a Muslim man or woman can have sex is in marriage. And then we wait until they're 25 or 30, even longer than that, to mm. help them get married. Like you said, what do you think is going to happen? What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, I mean, this stuff's going to happen. It is what it is. It's going to happen whether you like it or not. I wanted to just get your thoughts on polygyny, firstly and foremostly. We can talk about the specific niche of no strings in care afterwards, but what's your take on polygyny? Are you a polygynist man yourself? I don't know if you've been in polygyny before. Just give us a bit of background, inshallah. Yeah, I've never been in polygyny. I've been married to my wife now, what is it, 2022, so 12 years now. I think it's some, I'm open to it. I, at some point, I'd like to, to try it, but I'm wary of, I'm wary of the life that I've built with my wife and and i don't want to i don't want to jeopardize that over some new pum pum you know what i mean it's like <laughs> okay okay like some new flavors are nice but it's not worth like destroying your life over let me tell you something bro let me tell you something out here it's nice but best of Allah, yani, it's all the same breath it's all the same if you close your eyes if you were to close your eyes i guarantee you would not be able to tell which wife it was i guarantee it you would not be able to tell it's all the same. Every time my wife hears me say that, she's one, one of them. She says to me, thanks, Mahdi. You're making me feel really special. I'm like, bruv, I'm just like reporting the truth out here. I'm just a reporter. I'm just a journalist. Exactly. exactly. And also, I'm also wary of making sure I do it the right way because I don't want to show up on the day of judgment and then I messed up with this just because I messed up doing this and then just because I wanted to get a taste, you know? Because let's be honest, like the only reason we're doing it is Doing this is for the variety. Mm -hmm. There might might be like the rare like zero point one percent of saints in the Ummah who have a higher purpose in doing this. But for the most part, the only reason who, like, these people do it or men do it is because they want to do it. It's, it's good to be honest about the reason why we're doing it. So there's this podcaster. His name is James Altucher. He says there's a good reason and a, there's the good reason and the real reason for why people do things. The good reason is the one 
that they tell you to your face, the one that you'll accept. Yeah, mashallah, we want to support the divorced sisters, the widows. We want to fulfill the sunnah. Marry two, three, or four. Unless you can, you're scared you can't do justice, then marry only one. The real reason is guys want access to as many females as they can. And Islam came to put a limit on that. So that's the real reason. So I have no problem with polygyny. I'm a polygyny respecter, fan of polygyny. If it turns out that I'm, I'll be able to practice it, I will. If not, it's not a big deal. I have three businesses I'm trying to grow. And so I'm also mindful of that. I'm somebody who doesn't like hassle. I don't like drama. And so I would rather, my wife makes my life very easy for me. And I have three businesses run. And so why would I jeopardize that over just trying to get a taste of this thing? You know what I mean? No. So that's my view on it. But I'm down with it 100%. I'm not, I wish I would be able to practice it in a way that doesn't make my life difficult. But... If not, then it's not a big deal. I heard there's this app called No Strings De Care, whereby yeah. sisters are looking for some type of arrangement that you can reach. Yeah, just some apparently some guy has made it or something like this. Anyways, it's a good thing. And in in this case also, that's something that I would be down with. But then again, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't want to jeopardize the life I've built already. So it has to oh, be one hundred percent. And even though it'll be like, even though I don't have to consult my wife, I would consult her over it. I wouldn't do anything without her permission, even though I don't need her permission. Because, like, why do I? Why would I have to go to that hassle? Because like you're like you want to bring the fic into it, but then you're dealing with humans at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah Monsieur, I'm, I'm, you don't have to you don't have to announce the marriage. You can be secret, Monsieur, this and that. But you're dealing with human beings at the end of the right. day. And I am first and foremost a practical man, right? And so I'm not interested in doing dumb shit and blowing up my life over dumb shit. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah, and the more you have, the more you have to lose. It's quite clear that you've built your life. You're at a stage now whereby you're coming into your prime now. How old are you, Akhi Nabil? I had my 40th birthday in June. MashaAllah. So that's it. Now. 40 is the age of ashudda, of, of maturity. Between the age of 40 and 60, these are your prime years. So I get it. It's more of a calculated thing. I had a, a live with a brother, Nasir Al-Amin. I was on his channel, on Naima, Sister Naima's channel. And he mentioned, like, if I take on another wife, she has to genuinely bring value to my life because I'm good. Exactly. I'm good. Exactly. Yeah, I'm good. I'm in a good place. I'm in a good spot. So if I'm going to take on that responsibility, then I need to know, Habibti, what are you bring to the table? And don't just, it's don't... business. It's business at the end of the day. It's business. Yeah, it's a transaction. Yeah. It's a transaction. 100%. And I will say, I want to temper my statement just for the guys watching right now. When I said just now, it's all the same. Because I know guys hate it when they hear men say that. What do you mean it's all the same? It's like when guys say, oh, having lots of money is not all that. It's not all that being rich. They're actually right. It's true. It's not all that. But it's very offensive to hear that from someone who has it all, whilst the other person who's hearing it doesn't have much at all. It's like yeah. telling a starving person, oh, eating food and getting full up is not all that. It's not a big deal. It's... Yeah, but the guy's starving, bro. You understand? So I want to temper that statement by saying, try it. And if you want to try it, then try it. Just make sure you don't blow up your life, like Nabil said just now. Don't blow up your life over it. And you will realize for yourself that it really is, it's all the same, man. Yeah, yeah, I can't, it's not, when the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wasallam was with his companions once, and if I'm not mistaken, a woman walked past and he said to one of the companions, When if you see this and you feel some type of way, go home to your wife. I'm paraphrasing what he said. Okay, because what this woman has, your wife has as well. She has the same thing. It is the same thing. So absolutely, I agree with this. It is definitely not even a discussion, not worth blowing up your life over something that the wife you have already had it. Now, if you're with a woman who where things are rocky and she doesn't give you peace and so on, that's a different story. But if you're in a good place with your wife, you don't want to blow up your life over the sake of another shisma. I have multiple wives myself. I never disclose how many I have, but more than one, less than five. That's my generic answer to the brothers who want to know. And I, don't, I do not take risks whereby I'm going to blow up my life, Danny. Actually, I'll just be just. You know what? This is for NSN. I go out with I go out with my wives together. We go out together. We go out like a crew. <laughs> and it's funny because if you see us, it's like people are looking like, is he the bodyguard? Are those his sisters? What's going on? And then sometimes if my arms are around them, they're like, no, it can't be. Say it ain't so. But my point is, I'm not down to blow up my life over over taking uh, another habibti on. It's I want to say it's not worth it. It's beyond not worth it. The hassle and drama that comes with it and so on. And it's like also, you got to think about the costs associated 
with it. Okay, I know no since the car is has a special kind of solution to this, to this issue. But if the only reason you're going for no strings nikah is because you can't afford to get a, a, a co-wife, then you got to really think about what you're doing. So like from the man's perspective, I can understand from the woman's perspective, like she has, she has a stronger reason for going for the no strings nikah model than the, the man does. So I, like a lot of the, I see a lot of the guys in the app and like these people, I can tell they're barely holding on to one wife. Mm. and they're going for they're going for another wife they want some strange on the slide and so that's something you ought to be really careful of because there's going to be costs associated with this and no matter even if it's no strings to cut option three there are going to be costs associated with it and mm. if you can't even afford those costs like you have no business taking on taking on another wife yeah and this is again it's got this is bringing me back now to my initial thought of my my concern with NSN is that it's going to attract bottom feeders. And the truth is, it's not for bottom feeders, because one way or another, women are picking winners, even if she's willing to relinquish many of her rights, whether it's provision or time and so on. Don't get it twisted. What she is relinquishing here, she's just upping the ante here. So if she's relinquishing methylen, for example, time or provision like completely let's say she says just come to me once a week don't worry about money i've got that guess what you better be jacked bruv you better be able to do quite a few rounds without breaking a sweat because she's relinquishing here that's why i integrated a a fitness component with afsa and by the way shout out to six of you six of you mashallah have got a plan with afsa they're going through their nsn uh, transformations mashallah so i'm very happy to hear that alhamdulillah but whatever she's giving up here bro it's just overcompensating on this side. You yeah. can't be coming like you, you can barely run a mile and you're getting out of breath and all the rest of it. No, 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 no. Habibi, it doesn't work like that. You have to be no. Philip. Philip from You have Ghana. to be Philip. <laughs> Philip. Yes. Absolutely. Philip from Ghana. The I'm thing about and the thing, yeah. The thing about being like obese and like you're you're unable to maintain erections for long enough, you ejaculate. Uh, it takes you like you'll ejaculate faster than somebody is in better shape, mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of a lot of the problems that come with not being in shape. Just be, besides looking like shit. Absolutely. Look, you mentioned just now with regards to a penis health when you're obese. There's something called atherosclerosis, which is whereby the art, the arteries fill up with fat. That's why your blood pressure goes up when you're obese, right? But part of that hindrance of blood flow also extends itself to the member, to the private part, meaning the blood flow struggles to fill the private part and give you a full and wholesome erection, which is what you are looking for. So being overweight has many different consequences, not just the obvious ones, but the non-obvious ones. In fact, I'll tell you a story. There's a family member, extended family member in my extended family who was morbidly obese, very obese. We're talking like, 320 pounds 330 pounds and it's fat it's not muscle it's just fat right it's not that tall very obese and subhanallah for five years he was infertile Mm. he was infertile now i don't know whether him and his wife were trying for a child during that period of time but he already had one one child when he was slimmer ironically and i don't know if they were trying for a child during that period of time but she never conceived anyway He decided to finally take his health seriously because now he had contracted sleep apnea whereby your throat, you know what sleep apnea is, you just choke in the middle of the night and it wakes you up every 10 seconds, 15 seconds like that. It's a nightmare. Sleep apnea is absolutely awful. And he said, you know what, this is too much. This is literally ruining my life. I remember once actually he was in court and I was there to see it was quite a serious issue. He fell asleep whilst the judge was reading off his convictions. He was actually sleeping on the stand. Like... It was so embarrassing. It was like, bruv, you might be going to jail. You're falling asleep. But it wasn't his fault because he was in a perpetual state of extreme fatigue because his brain was never sleeping. It was constantly waking up at night. Anyway, took his health seriously, started losing a bit of weight. Lo and behold, his wife fell pregnant and he was considered clinically fertile again. Now, I don't know what the science is and the math and blah, blah, blah. All I know is when my man was hella fat, he was infertile, considered infertile. When he lost weight, his fertility went up. His wife fell pregnant and she was 10 years older as well. Do you know what I'm saying? It's it's a massive deal. And you know what? 
I don't know if you have any knowledge on this, Akhi Nabil, but aside from losing weight and staying in shape and so on, what else can a man do for his member health? For member health. Member meaning the member. Honestly, I don't know too much about the subject. Probably the best guy I know of to to read and watch and listen to is Sterling Cooper. He has a mm. lot of products also that talk about this. And they're not they're pretty affordable. One of his products on improving your member health is like a hundred dollars or something like that. But it, there might be some things that are not safe for work. In, in any case, Elohim, if you wanna if you wanna check his stuff out, I would recommend that. But to be honest, I have I don't know too much about this. I've read articles here and there. I know of some exercises that you can do is is jelking. Those does, that, things. does that work? Because I heard someone said to me those exercises are dangerous as well. No, it's not dangerous. Uh, there's a lot of a lot of guys do it. I think there's it's only dangerous if you like over overdo it. So there's okay. there's a particular it's like weight training almost. So you got to do you have a three day a week <laughs> a three day a week program. Well, <laughs> that kind of, routine. Yeah, exactly <laughs> that kind of thing. But there's different kinds of foods that you can eat. Foods that increase that have that increase like nitric oxide in the blood. Oh. Sub, like natural supplements you can take like your heart health is very important as well so if mm. you have good cardio like you're you're able to use harder and longer erections that's an important like like so if you're like uh, all you're doing is power lifting and you're like the typical fat power lifter who's like totally jacked but is he looks like he's got it's a, like a thick coating of fat around a lot of muscle like you're gonna have problems so like oh, cardio yeah. is important I'll extend upon that, actually. This is a really good, uh, interesting point. I have a friend who, his father, I'm actually, uh, I, his father likes me and I like him. I wouldn't say we're close, but every time I see him in the message, he talks to me. He like, uh, We have good conversations. And he's around my dad's age, or maybe a little bit younger, which is 60s. And he recently had open heart surgery, which is a big thing. Like, they cut you open and, like, major open heart surgery. And I said to him, why? And he, it all came to a height. I can't remember if he had a stroke or a heart attack. But I said to him, how did it get to this point? Because you are in shape. The man is jacked. When I say jacked, he is jacked. He's still jacked. Even now, like, just decades of, of working out. And he said to me, the doctors told me I was carrying too much muscle for my heart to pump around the body. And let me explain for, the, for those of you who might be confused. What do you mean? So when you work out weight training, you work out the muscle but not the heart, which is also a muscle. So your muscles grow, but the heart is the same size. Now that heart has to feed or pump blood around this now bigger motorway of muscles and arteries and veins and so on. The muscle didn't grow, sorry, the heart muscle didn't grow with the rest of your muscles. Whereas when you do cardiovascular exercise, the heart muscle actually grows. If you have a look at the heart of a long distance runner, it's massive, it's like a hand. It's absolutely huge. They've got massive heart gains. They might be skinny here, but their heart is enormous. So when you work, when you get big muscles, if you're not co complementing that with a healthy cardio cardiovascular regime, and I'm not talking about doing your little steps, yeah? Your little flipping, having a conversation on the phone whilst you're running at three kilometers per hour on the treadmill. No, my friend, no. You should not be able to talk. You need to be sweating so that your heart health is taken care of and the heart muscle can grow with it and pump blood around the body in, in to compensate for your new size does that make sense what i'm saying absolutely absolutely and the more the better cardio you have it helps you with your strength training as well because you have more work capacity your mm. and you need you you can you can rest less it's like if, you. if you've ever trained with a fat power lifter like i i'm a fat power lifter so like you need 10 10 minutes between like reps so you gotta yeah. do your one set and then you're gonna sit around until you recover but if you're in good heart health you can you can do a set a heavy set and then go back to that in a lot faster and so it helps with your workouts as well so I, there's this program that people talk a lot about it's called zone two cardio there's a lot of people doing it where it basically you're not doing cardio, but you're not doing it to the point where you're you're working flat out. And so what it does is over time, it so like you have a minimum and a maximum, right? And you have between the two, you have an average, right? right? And most what most people do is they try to increase the maximum in whatever they're trying to do, okay? But if they try to, and that's how they increase the average, but if they try to increase the floor. Okay, mm. the average goes up automatically, as ah. well as the as well as the maximum. How so do like you increase? It's by doing this zone two thing, right? Where 
you are working, you're working at a decent rate. And I, I don't know the details about zone two, but basically you're working at a rate where you can have a conversation for a decently long period of time and you never exit that, that zone two state. You're always in that area. And as you do it, it becomes much easier for you to do a harder cardio work. So all out mm -hmm. work. And it and when you do the all out work, your heart rate returns to baseline a little bit faster, a little bit faster. And you can think about it in, in terms of you're a strength, you're a strength training guy. So they, ha, they call this thing called undulating period is periodization, where basically the goal is to add volume and to add volume to the point where you're doing a lot more work over a shorter period of time. And so you increase the strength that way. It's like your, uh, it's, so you do your warm ups, right? Let's say you do your warm ups in weight training and it's not that big of a deal. They're, they're very easy warm ups, right? But eventually over time, you find that you're able to, even without trying, your warm-up kind of exercises, you become stronger at them. And mm -hmm. then let's say you do, so I do like Olympic lifting, right? And so we have the barbell complex warm-up routine and it's light. It's not taxing at all. It's not like doing the main sets or anything like that. But the volume that you do every single workout, eventually it becomes very easy. And then you become stronger, a lot stronger in general. And that has an effect on your ability to do the other workouts. As what you've done is you've raised the floor. And because right. you've raised the floor, you've raised the average. And Especially raising the floor is a lot easier. Yes. Yeah, you're absolutely right. Number one, going flat out all the time actually taxes your central nervous system heavily. And although it's good to go flat out every now and again, going flat out all the time is just going to break your body. So it's very taxing on the central nervous system. Number two, you're right. It reminded me of my sports science days. Now you build your, you need a strong base level in order to be able to build a strong peak level. If your base level is weak, your peak will always be limited. And exactly as you've just said, because again, you're bringing back my memory from sports science, the it's easier to raise your base and it will at the same time help you to increase your max as well. Your maximum effort attempts. Uh, whatever cardiovascular exercise you do. Do you have any specific preferences yourself with regards to... I do boxing three times a week and my coach crushes me. So I'm forced to do cardio and whatever he tells me to do, I do it. So <laughs> these past few weeks, we've been doing runs with the sauna suit on. It's like Oof. hell. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, you're in Dubai as well. Nah, <laughs> mate. Can't be running with a sauna suit in Dubai. Even now, it's still hot. What's the temperature yeah. in Dubai right now? It's in the cold season now, so it's getting a lot better. But we're in the gym doing the with the sauna suit on the treadmill, so it was not. It's still bad, but it's manageable. And so we do. We he takes me on the pads. We have sparring, and we do the bags as well. So that's the cardio. I actually hate cardio, so it's good that I have a boxing trainer who forces me to do it. Otherwise, I would never do it. Until I started boxing, I didn't do cardio for maybe over 10 years wow that's a long time yeah so what were you just doing just like lifting weights i just a squat bench deadlift bro <laughs> classical that classical gym bro routine man <laughs> exactly yeah. Okay, there's a couple of questions here from the post that I put up on the NSN Brothers group that I want to go through, inshallah. Bahzad, he asks, you've connected with a sister. She's interested. How do you turn her, make her feel comfortable and move forward? Fadl, I want you to take that. I told the brothers that you would take all the questions on women. I see it. I'm more interested in hearing you first. I, I might add to something, but I'm more yeah. interested from hearing you first. So repeat the question again. You've connected with a girl. So he's connected with a girl on NSN. She's interested. How do you turn her? I think he means how do you progress the conversation? Make her feel comfortable and move forward? That's a question. Do you make her feel comfortable and then move forward? What do you do? So on a marriage app, I'm not interested in running game. Mm -hmm. but my goal is either I get her out into the real life for a meeting so we can meet face to face as soon as possible. And then the next goal is to get her, get in touch with her father or whoever is her male guardian. The problem with being in the dms of a marriage app or any dms whatsoever for too long is she's got like 50 other guys in her dms at the same time and so yeah. like you have a, a wall of post-its they're all yellow post-its which post-it does your eye pay attention to the right? red one yeah exactly so you got to replace you got to replace one of the yellow post-its with a red post-it and now when you look at the wall your eye immediately goes to the red post-it so you got to be the red post-it and there's 50 guys in her DMs already that you have no idea, but she makes it think, think like you're the only guy she's talking to because they're mm. very good at that. They are. Like, so you've got, you got to get a, 
you got to get her out into the real world as soon as possible for the first meeting, just to make sure that she is who she says she is. She's not catfishing you. She's not 50 pounds heavier than her photos, that kind of thing. You make sure she's not crazy because some of these chicks have issues like psychological issues that they might be dealing with. You've got to try to suss that out. And then if that goes well, first thing you got to do is you got to talk to her dad. And then after that, man, I follow, I like your routine is what is three meetings, right? That's it. That's yeah. it. She only gets three meetings. And then if it's not, if it's not happening, it's not happening. That's um, it. I like, because if you have to think about, you have to think about like your time is worth something, right? Um, and like you could be doing other things with that time you could be making money you could be learning something you could be in the gym getting jacked there's a million different even if you're time. doing nothing with that time she's not getting it for free she cannot i don't care if you're at home s stranded in your bed and you can't move she's not getting that time because the moment you give that time away too freely and too easily guess what it holds a little value do you see the problem yeah Absolutely. And on, like, we're on a, so you, they're on a marriage app, right? The implication is, and the understanding is that people are there to get married. And so if somebody is wasting your time without moving the discussion forward and moving the ball forward, then you know that that person is not serious and you should just next them. Don't waste mm. your time. It's a business decision. And you as a man, you have a much easier ability and inclination to make it strictly business. Because you're not going to catch feelings. You're not going to catch feelings the way a woman is going to catch feelings. I think, if you, see, a lot of the problem, Akhi Nabil, is the fact that the average brother, the average Abdullah, he has so few sisters actually paying interest in him that it's very hard for him to cultivate this abundance mindset. Yeah. I covered this on my stream the other day. So when a sister does actually pay interest in him, he starts pinning a lot of hope on her. And it becomes very difficult for him to deal with her nonchalantly like this. How do you deal with that? You're a man who doesn't have a wife. You get very little interest expressed in you. Suddenly a sister shows attention to you. She's interested in you. How do you still maintain frame? Sounds cliche, but it's the truth. And deal with her in a manner that doesn't exude neediness or lack of options, so to say. That's a, that is a problem when you have no options and you think that this is like he, he, with guys mostly it's usually one at a time it's not like there's 50 it's not like chicks where there's 50 guys in the dms there's usually one one lead <laughs> there's one lead at a time it's with one both, lead bro guys. it's one there's lead, one lead. One you, gotta, you gotta convert this one lead i right. i get it and i sympathize and i empathize however that being said following it falling in love or following in lust or being infatuated does to men what dick does to women Oof. so a woman had goes through too many dicks a woman goes through too many dicks it becomes very difficult for her to care bond and love again mm. a man gives his heart to too many women it becomes impossible for him to love again Ooh. and so you have to be very careful who you who you give your heart to as a man because if you give your heart to the wrong woman and you give your heart to too many wrong women it's going when you eventually do get married it's going to be very difficult for you to have a deep connection with your wife. That's just something I've observed. And so like, you have to be careful, even though I know it's just the one lead, do it one lead at a time if you have to. And really, in, I'm not saying this as a as like Islamic advice, this is just business advice. Just treat it as a business deal and you won't go wrong. It's, um, it's funny that you use the business analogy because in business, the one who has the upper hand is the one who's willing to walk away from the deal. He's the one who has the upper hand. And he, he, ironically, he's the one who's most likely to get the terms that he wants by virtue of the fact that he's willing to walk away and pull the plug. Uh, you've yeah. heard, you guys have heard me quote, say this quote over and over again. He who is willing to commit suicide has the initiative. And maybe sometimes that means you will actually commit suicide on that particular lead. It, it happens. But the truth is, if you start like getting super needy and clingy and too much conversation and attention, just remember you are one of many even in the average bint inbox. Yeah. I'm not talking about the superstar. No, I'm talking about the single mom with five kids, bruv. Her inbox is full, full. I'm sorry to say, and it's the truth. Yeah, It is what that's, it is. That's actually an important thing to remember as well. I know we, we joked about it and we glossed it over, but that's important. Realize that you're not the only guy who's talking to her. Once you realize that, then you'll be much less likely to become infatuated with her. Because because women get upset about men running game, but women like game is in a woman's nature like she's a, they're the original game runners 
Like you ever see like a woman try a woman in a group of friends and she's replying a, replying to a text of a guy she likes. Like she'll write the text and then she'll workshop that text around her friends before sending it because they're yeah. all trying to they're all trying to like basically send the perfect response. So they're the original runners of games. So don't be afraid of being nonchalant. Don't feel like you're going to hurt their feelings. Don't feel like there's not going to be the other, um, this is my one chance and I need to nail this, uh, this bint or whatever, convert this bin, whatever, convert the sale, however you want to say it, because there's going to be more eventually. And like, even if there isn't, that's more time for you to work on yourself because her value, like with every day, just imagine a woman and a man, right? Her value every day is dropping. Your value every day is increasing. As long as you're doing the right things, no. like you every, like every day you spend doing the right things, your value increases. And so while you might lose this one a year from now, six months from now, even three months from now, maybe you will be more valuable to be able to comp- command a higher price in the market. And so you'll be, you'll have access to a lot, a, a better pool of females mm. and that will continue to increase until, until you max out. Probably mm. it, it'll continue to increase in, until your fifties. There is a, there is a, like an upper limit where the man, a man's value starts to decline. But even until your 50s or 60s, you can, be, you can be pulling girls very high quality if you continue to do the right things. It's, they say, what do they say? They say, they, they say men age like wine and women age like... So, hey, it's the truth. But that is contingent upon the fact that you are doing the work. And I know it sounds cliche, do the work. Yeah, but it's true. I don't know what you want me to tell you. You have to be doing the work. So it is contingent upon that because the truth of the matter is the great mass of men are undesirable, particularly in the soft Western world that we live today. They're not like women are not lining up to be with the average Abdullahs of the world. And this is just the sad reality. But this offers an opportunity for the individuals who are willing to just do a little bit more than the average guy to stand out immediately. You will stand out because the low the level is so low. The level is so low that it doesn't take much to distinguish yourself. What is it? Is it 70% of, of individuals are overweight in the US now? Or is it 80%? Not obese, but just overweight. 70, yeah. 70%, 70% are overweight. Guess what? If you're in shape, then you're in the top 30% of individuals who are not overweight. We can go on and on down this list of ways to differentiate and distinguish yourself. But the bottom, the truth of the matter is the level is low and it doesn't take much to distinguish yourself and stick out from the crowd, so to speak. One thing yeah, I will no, say is there, there's no competition. Go ahead. There's no competition. One thing I will say is I have found it. I didn't start YouTube for this reason. Reason I didn't start online content for this reason, but it was an uncanny side effect. When you have an online presence, women start falling in love with the idea of you, as opposed to who you really are. Because the truth of the matter is, you don't know who I am. I could be some psycho. That's the bottom line. I'm presenting. I'm putting my best foot forward on the internet. But they start falling in love with the idea of you. And it, so what I'm saying to you, brothers, is if you have a skill, a talent, knowledge of some sort in anything, absolutely doesn't have to be relationships and things like that. It can be absolutely anything. Start putting that content out there, not for the sake of the women, more importantly, for the sake of the audience that you will build, that audience loyalty. Now, this goes back to right to the beginning of the podcast, which is build the audience. As Nabil said, third time entrepreneurs build an audience first because this is going to benefit you for your businesses moving forward. I'm just saying one of the interesting side effects is that women are paying attention and they're watching and they're observing. And then they start formulating this image of you. And now it's actually, it's hard to mess it up with them because they have this image of you in their mind that I, that you have not had to create yourself. No amount of game was necessary for that. It's just been created in their mind. And it's actually hard to destroy that because they want to believe this about you. So just some, just food for thought for those of you who may have skills, talents, knowledge in anything. It doesn't have to be this. It can be anything. Put it out there. Benefit the people. And you will see just one of the uncanny side effects of that is women paying attention. There's another question here, Akhi. Let me see now. It is from, from Cal. No, sorry. Bahazad again. He says, for brothers who are working a 9 to 5, what online business should they look into? What can they invest in? What side hustles are the most profitable and so on? Do you have anything on this, Akhi Nabil? Yeah, if you've, never, if you've never run a business before and this is your first t- attempt trying to make, make additional money, your number one concern is getting cash in the cash in your cash in your account. And so and so what are your what are the skills that you have currently? There are people who want to pay you to use those to use your skills. 
And so my, my, my recommendation always is freelancing for first and foremost, you've got to put at least five hours a week into it. That's minimum. And so anybody can have five hours, five hours a week. You just watch a little bit less YouTube. You'll have enough time go look up some freelance websites like Upwork, sir.com. There's, there's websites specific to particular ta- skill sets like sp- specific kinds of freelancing websites for coders and things like that. So you can look up those, just do a Google search for freelancing websites for whatever particular skill you have, and then start freelancing that way and try to get, try to get play- paying clients. I don't have time to go into it in too much detail, but that's the fastest way for you to make additional money. The other options all require that you get something in in addition to what you already have so let's say let's take e-commerce for example or selling e-commerce on amazon you need to have additional skill in order to make that work and you need to have additional capital to make that work let's take course creation you need to have you need to have clear expertise in the course that you're trying to teach and you need to build an audience for it otherwise you have to pay you you have to pay money for advertising to sell the course. So that's an additional, and you need to understand, you need to know marketing in all these additional cases. You want to start selling a skill like copywriting. Say you're, a, you think you're of yourself a pretty good writer. You need to actually learn copywriting because it's like somebody who, like a funny guy who tells a lot of jokes, thinks he can be a stand up comedian. No, he can't be a stand up comedian just because it's funny. No, it's an actual skill that you have to learn. Just because you're good at writing doesn't mean you can be, become a copywriter. Just because you can write words in the English language doesn't mean you can become a copywriter. I've spent three years writing millions of words just to get slightly above average. And I've spent probably $50,000 on my education. So it's not an wow. easy skill to learn. Wow. So it's not an easy skill to learn and you just can't jump into it like that. So you can't just pick a random thing and try to start making money with it. I would find out what skills you already have use those skills and find people who are willing to pay you to to deliver a service using those skills that's the fastest way to make money online if you've never started a business of yourself before beautiful absolutely beautiful i actually did a copywriting course as well myself and i was because i thought i'm, I'm all right english Pfft, bruv doesn't matter if you're all right at english you need to know how to capture attention you know that ada framework for example that you put on the muslim man group on the nsn app you're absolutely right there is a methodology to attracting attention that's the bottom line that's what it comes down to copywriting is attracting and then holding attention and then the conclusion of which is making a conversion whether it's getting an email sign up or making a sale or whatever and there is a framework for that and why bother trying to figure it out yourself when you can just learn from someone who knows what they're doing you'll save a lot of time you might think oh it's but it's going to cost me money it's either it costs you money or it costs you time and usually the time is far more expensive than the money because the time you spent wasting trying to figure it out yourself was time that you could have actually spent earning this is how you have to see things someone once said to me once he was debating purchasing this course for five thousand dollars i had no idea what it was for he said to me yeah but it's too expensive though i said to him what do you mean it's expensive i said is it roi positive or not he said, oh yeah absolutely i know if i get this course then for sure it's going to improve my skill set and i will earn more and I said, this, this is no brainer what do you mean it's expensive we have to change the thinking when it comes to money in general money is a tool it's not something to get emotionally connected to it's a tool i don't care if the course costs you fifty thousand or five hundred thousand if it is roi positive there is a track record you can see this is a bona fide individual he's got his credentials in his space he knows what he's doing etc that's why you pay twenty thousand pound a year or whatever it is to go to university because you believe it's roi positive which it's not by the way yeah you don't mind paying for that but five thousand dollars for a course? Oh, I don't know, bro. You got it all wrong, upside down, yeah, completely upside down. So just changing the thinking with regards to money itself and the cost of education and so on. You just need to just weigh it up. Take away your emotion from it. It's not emotional. Money doesn't have emotions. It doesn't care. I think this yeah. is a good place to conclude. But uh, I'm going to be taking snippets of this and putting it on YouTube, inshallah. So for those who want to find you. How can they find you? What type of services do you offer? I know you have a book coming soon. Tell us, inshallah. Yeah, 
if the audience is going to be ma- mainly Muslim dudes, so I would just recommend they go to muslimman.com and subscribe to the newsletter. That's probably the easiest thing to do. They can also go to my own personal website, which is nabilaziz.com, and you probably drop that in the show notes or whatever in the comments when this goes up. But yeah, muslim muslimman.com and subscribing to the newsletter will get you whatever you need. Excellent. And, and your book as well. Tell us about your book that's coming soon. So the book that's coming soon is going to be published in January 2023. They're actually in the process of editing it right now. So it's called 40 Hadith on Masculinity. And the subtitle is How to Be a Good Man. And the reason why I decided to start with this book is because there's a lot of discussion and debate online, even around this, a lot of these male influencers like Andrew Tate and things like that about what does it mean to be a good man? What does it mean to be masculine? What does it mean to be alpha and that kind of thing? And there's a lot of debate because there's, there's the secular way of doing it. And then obviously we have our own Islamic paradigm and that's where there's a lot of conflict and clashing about this. So what I decided was along with the team at Wordsmiths, Let's do this book. Let's make it. This is going to be the final word on masculinity and Muslim men, Islamic masculinity, whatever you call it. Just masculinity in general, because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the last and final messenger for all of mankind. And he is the hujjah of, uh, of everybody. And so it's going to be the final word on this subject. So once this book comes out, you're not going to need any other reference. You, need, you, won't, need to, you won't need to have any more arguments. It's all going to be in the book. And... What they're doing is something very interesting. It's like they're going back and going through the hadith and defining terms and things like that according to what the original intention was of the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, without all of the baggage, right? What does masculinity mean? What does courage mean? What does leadership mean? So all of like the explanations and definitions will be from the parallax or the frame of reference of the messenger's words as they were originally intended as opposed to when we say mas- masculinity or manhood now that has all these connotations associated with it that may or not may or may not be accurate or relevant in an islamic paradigm so that's the idea behind the book and it's coming out in january 2023 and you can actually pre-order the pre-order the book right now pre-order your copy and where if, can we pre-order from if you go to muslimman.com you'll find the link to pre-order it Excellent. Excellent. Barakallah Fik. Nabil, this has been an absolute pleasure, Rahi. I really appreciate you. Can uh, Where can the people find you online? On Instagram and maybe Facebook or Instagram? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. It's all the same. Nabil Aziz DXB. And if you just search for my name, Nabil Aziz. I'm going to put all the links in the description, guys. So you'll be able to find them there, inshallah. Ta'ala. Yeah. So it's Nabil Aziz DXP on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you search for me, you'll find me. I'm pretty distinctive on my profile pictures. You can't miss me. Khalas, it's been an absolute pleasure. Akhi Nabil, Jazakallah khairan. I look forward to speaking to you again soon, inshallah. Barakallah. Habibi, salamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Wa alaikum salam wa rahmatullah.